Robert, how you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. How are you? Doing great. So, Robert, we uh, this is kind of a side note, but I believe um, we met with Stuart Draper years ago okay. in Florida at a um, uh, what's the bread company? Uh, Panera Bread, didn't we? Yes, we did. Wow, that's very good memory. I'm impressed. So. So Robert, I don't know if you knew this, but that was our very first conference we ever went to uh, with Stu Kent. This was in Florida, probably 2014. Uh, the very first conference when conferences used to be the thing that we all did. Uh, that was our first one. We had a great time there. Uh, it's where we launched our, our digital marketing simulation at and our text in our digital marketing textbook. And um, I was finally, we, we put that together we're like this is robert kroll from 2014. <laughs> so it's nice to have that kind of circle back around um and, and have you on here uh to discuss workplace soft skills uh from marketing students and so I'll give just a brief introduction to uh for you and then we'll let you take over from there sound good absolutely great so rob kroll is the program director for the digital marketing degrees at full sail university joining the programs at their inception in 2008. Rob taught consumer behavior and SEO before his current role. He is a proponent of helping students become well-rounded graduates who commit to lifelong learning, high ethical standards, and professional and personal growth. We're excited to learn about those soft, uh, those soft skills. And uh, we'll turn the time over to you. If you have questions, throw them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm happy to see that your first conference worked out so well. And all these years later, here you are. Still around. Must have worked out OK. <laughs> <laughs> very, very impressive. Yes, indeed. Um, so I'm going to talk about workplace soft skills today. But before I get started, I want to give you a fair warning that I may need to take frequent water breaks because this is a beautiful time of year to live in Florida, and apparently all of the allergens in the world also think so. But I think with a few sips of water here and there, I'll be okay. Um, I also wanted to uh, wanted to say I hope that you were able to see the other presentations that have gone on today, especially the one from Nathan David, who was talking more about tools and specific tools and kind of hard skills. And I have to admit, I might have been cheering out loud a little bit because I absolutely agree with everything that he was saying. And it, his, his presentation really dovetails nicely into, into mine completely, uh, completely coincidentally um, because while he was talking about the, the hard, more technical skills, I want to talk about the kind of soft skills that are also important for marketing students to obtain. Right, so before we get started, let's talk about what are we actually talking about here. When we were coming up with this presentation, there was actually some kind of back and forth about what to call it, because the terminology that a lot of people are familiar with is soft skills. Um, but in some ways, that feels like it diminishes it, right? Be because if you say you can learn hard skills or you could learn soft skills, soft skills might sound less important that way. And it goes by a whole bunch of different names here. So 21st century skills, professional skills, but all of these things are basically talking about the kinds of things that are shown on this slide. And this is certainly not a complete list of what we're talking about, but just to give you an idea of the kind of things that we're trying to, trying to convey in this presentation so that we can help our students be better prepared for the workplace. Um, so, how important are these skills? Right? So you can see in, in this chart here, this is um, things that were rated very important um, by executives and hiring managers. And you can see these are things that we all know, right? Being able to communicate orally, being able to communicate in writing, being able to work in teams, being able to work independently. Right, so these are all the things that employers are saying, these are really important skills for people who are working for us to have. In a separate study, the Georgia Department of Labor said that of the, of the businesses they surveyed, 85% said that they were really concerned about their workers' poor soft skills. So 
employers think this is important and it's getting more important um, because, because with everything being automated and more and more being automated every day, there are those skills that are, you know, that are less in demand because they can be done by a machine, right? Things that require um, memorization, quantitative skills, things that can be taught to a machine are not going to be done by humans. If, if they're not already obsolete, they will be obsolete at some point. But at least at this point, the uniquely human skills are still going to be in demand until machines take that over too, which that's a, at least a little ways down the road, hopefully. Um, but you know, the interpersonal skills, you can't really teach a machine those kinds of things. And those are the kinds of things that it's important that we, we in, impose on our, not impose, but we teach our students um, that these things are really important. So my programs have um, an advisory committee that meets several times each year, and these are industry professionals who are helping guide us in terms of what our students need to be learning. And I can tell you in all honesty, at every single meeting that we have, someone talks about professional skills because there are all kinds of examples of new employees or even seasoned employees who really don't understand all of the kinds of things that are required of them in the workplace. So it's things like you know, one of our advisory committee members talks about how she, uh, a, an employee came into her office, asked a question while she was trying to look up the answer, they walked around behind her desk and watched her enter her password. So things like that, but also things like, you know, these new, these new employees don't know how to prioritize. They don't know how to ask for clarification if they're not sure how to do something. Um, so the employers are definitely seeing what, what we're talking about here. And, you know, you may have heard the, the saying before that people get hired for soft skills and fired for soft skills. And it's certainly true. And these are, um, these are, uh, taken from a kind of informal survey that Forbes did um, for an article about the bitter truth about why people fail at their jobs. So this was a survey of some 200 employers, and these are just some of the things that they said impacted employees. So employees got fired, they didn't get promoted, or they got poor performance reviews. For, for these things, and there were probably twice as many of this that just didn't fit onto the slide. But you can see these are all kinds of things. So sort of the really amorphous things, like they didn't mesh in with the organizational culture, um, to they actually stole something from the company. And um, you know some of these things do seem like they should be obvious, but things are not always as obvious as we might wish they were. Um, and so this slide is also from that article in Forbes, and I think this is really true because if you interview people, right? Like if I get a resume from someone and I can see, I can see their education, I can see their work experience, have a pretty good handle on what their skill set would be. What I can't see is can they manage their time effectively? Can they work with other people? Can they lead? Um, and those are all the kinds of things that as an interviewer, I'm really trying to dig out during an interview, um, but they're very hard to see. And this is why a lot of times people will get hired for a job and then it doesn't work out, not because they don't know how to do the job, but because they don't know how to behave in the workplace. They don't understand the expectations of employers. Um, so a big problem is there is a kind of huge disconnect between what we hear from employers and what students actually think about themselves. So it's sort of like that thing where if you ask someone or if you ask a group of people, you know, how they would rate themselves, somehow everyone rates themselves above average, which we all know is statistically impossible. It's the same sort of thing with this. You can see from this table, the middle column is where employers rated recent, recent grads proficient. 
And the right-hand column is students who believe themselves to be proficient, right? So there is a huge disconnect there. If you just take, take a look at the first, the first row, right? In professionalism and work ethic, just about four out of 10 employers would rate recent grads as proficient at that. And almost nine out of 10 students believe that they're proficient at that. So I think for, in, in my opinion, a big part of what we have to do is help students realize that they're not all above average, right? That they are, that these skills are not only important, but that they need to work at developing them. Um, so why is this all an issue, right? So it's very easy to say, to kind of, you know, roll your eyes and say, oh, these, this younger generation or these new graduates, um, but that's not true. These problems have really always been around. They may be, they may be exhibiting in different ways today, but a lot of this stuff has always been around. Being able to manage your time is no different today than it was 20 years ago. We just have different tools for managing our time and probably different distractions than, than we had back then. But the basic idea is still the same. There are, of course, differences in society, right? Technology causes all kinds of changes in, in how we work, the ways that we communicate. You know, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when, you know, when you wanted to communicate with someone in the office or a group of people, you sent out a memorandum. And, you know, obviously students today are not even gonna know what that is. Um, but there, there are also generational differences, and I think that sometimes gets overemphasized. But there, there is a difference between someone who may be, uh, maybe a recent graduate who is younger, and their boss who may be, you know, middle aged or something. Just in things like what's acceptable behavior in the workplace, what level of formality do does the boss expect from me? I also think one of the one of the issues that causes it for us at the college level is that prior to getting to us in K through 12, the focus has been really a lot on really tangible skills that can be measured because the students have to pass these tests. They have to have these specific skill sets. So so they have to teach to that, which is why there aren't classes like home ec anymore in, in most schools, right? Because they, ha they, have to, they have to teach the students the hard skills. And the last thing I want to say is it's also easy, I think, for people who have been working for a while to, to feel like, oh, this is common sense. Why don't, why don't they know this, right? But it, isn't, it is not common sense. Right, common sense is don't put your hand on the stove while it's hot. Common sense is not how do I properly address an email to a client, right? That's something that you have to learn. And you might have to learn not to put your hand on the stove too, depending on, on how quick you are, I guess. Um, so um, here's an example of sort of we don't know what we don't know. Um, in my, my very first real job interview after college a thousand years ago. Um, I, I was a finance major. I was I had an interview with an investment management company, right? So when I say investment management company, what do you picture, right? Formal suits, Wall Street kind of thing. But what they said to me when they called me for the interview was, we don't wear suits, you can dress casual. So 22 year old me was like, yes, I don't have to wear a suit. And then 22 year old me said, what does that even mean? What should I actually wear? And so I chose something that I felt was professional um, and it was dress slacks and a purple sweater. Not that color of purple, but purple. And the first thing that the president of the company said to me was, why did you wear purple? And so within 30 seconds, I was pretty sure I was not getting that job. Um, ultimately, I did. But my point is that I didn't know, 
right? I had no idea. My parents were working class people. They didn't have any idea. I didn't know anyone in the finance industry. Didn't really even know any real professionals to turn to to ask for advice. So I think that for me is one of the reasons that we have to pay attention to what our students need and to give them the resources. I mean, they're not gonna always be able to come to us and say, hey, what should I wear to this interview? Um, but to give them the resources and the connections so that they do have places to go to get those questions answered, but also that they're equipped with more of the skills that are gonna be needed all the time. Right, but the hurdles for us as educators are that it's really hard to teach this. It's really hard to grade this, right? Because these skills are not tangible for the most part, right? As marketers, at least I know, uh, at least I know at our school, we're always focusing on goals. What's the ROI of that campaign? What's the open rate of that? How many bounces are there, right? So all of these things that are clearly, that are able to be really articulated, and they're not always able to do that when it's a soft skill. We also find, and I, I don't know if this is true across the board, but a lot of marketing students seem to have some aspiration to be entrepreneurial in some way. Maybe not right away, maybe not right after they graduate, but at some point. So they want to freelance, they want to open their own marketing agency, they want to start their own business of some sort. And so what we get a lot is, well, I don't need, I don't need to know this stuff because I'm gonna have my own business and I'm going to do, do what I want to do anyway. And so trying to, trying to convince them that even if you're running your own agency, you're gonna to have to talk to clients, you're gonna to have to talk to employees, you're gonna to have to write emails to people, you're going to have to have to be able to articulate why you need funding for something. And so really trying to help them see that there is some value in this. Um, and lastly, I think that virtual work does require some new, different kind of skills in some ways. Um, and I know, you know, with everything sort of suddenly being accelerated to to virtual work, um, this has become even more important. And I feel like in some ways that 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 snowball started rolling down the hill and it's really kind of rolling over everyone at this point. I mean, I'm sure you probably know because I certainly do, people who professional people who probably need help with their Zoom professional skills. Um, so things like that, just being able to know like you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't have. Um, the fan going on behind you while you're on Zoom and you're speaking because it's really distracting kinds of things. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what, how do I actually incorporate any of this kind of vague stuff into my class? Um, so these are my, uh, my recommendations, um, which are um, first and foremost, make this as high a priority as you can at the highest level you can. I happen to have an advantage in that Full Sail has always had a big commitment to professional skills because it started out like 40 years ago as a school that taught recording arts. So they were teaching very hard specific skills like can you operate this soundboard? Um, and over time they found that employers were coming back to them and saying, okay, these people have the skills, but they're not showing up for work on time, or they don't know how to manage their tasks, or they don't know how to communicate. So Full Sail as a university incorporated what we call global professionalism standards, which is in every single class. Um, so that means that in every single class, we are saying to the students, you are starting out with a 100 in professionalism in this class. Here is a list of things that you could lose professionalism points for. So those are things like being rude to your classmates, not showing up for a meeting that you scheduled with your instructor, sort of those kind of things that we're trying to teach students not to do. But that's really a stick, right? We're sort of, sort of you know, smacking them on the knuckles for 
doing something that we don't want to do. But at the same time, we want to want to offer positive reinforcement for the things that we do want them to do. So we want them to help out their classmates if their classmates are struggling to understand a concept. We want them to attend guest speaker sessions that may not be part of the specific class that they're in. So they can earn professionalism points for doing those things. Um, and the, the real thing about that that makes it valuable is that employers can ask for a student's professionalism score. So as an employer, I could look at a, at a graduate and say, they have a really good GPA, but their professionalism score is not that great. So I feel like they are probably technically capable of doing the job, but also maybe not at the maturity level they need to be at to be able to really function effectively in the workplace. Um, so obviously that's not something that can be instituted everywhere, but I think the idea of that, of being able to really identify for students what are the skills that, that you need to have is really, really important. And not only identify them, but explain to them why these skills are important. All of that stuff that I talked about earlier with the employers, like it, I mean, I know sometimes students are just going to, to glaze over that because it feels like it's not, it's not concrete. It's harder to, for them to learn those kinds of things. You can't just sit down and, and look at a book and you know, learn how to, how to ask questions if you don't understand something. Um, but that's where we come in and we, you know, try to, when we see those skills, um, even if we can't measure them, because sometimes you can measure skills, right? Like if a student has issues with their communicating and writing, we can, we can identify that, we can, we can evaluate that for them. But if they have issues with, with relating to their peers, it's harder to do that, right? But when you see tangible examples of that, especially positive tangible examples of that, make sure that you point it out, even if it's not a part of their grade or their feedback. Um, and again, I think emphasizing how important this is, but especially for students in things like digital marketing. I used to teach search engine optimization. I had to change my class all the time because that changes all the time. So it's important for our students to understand that A, they have to be lifelong learners because they're gonna have to stay current with what's happening in the industry, but also that these kind of professional skills are transferable and they're more timeless. So how do you, you know, how do you go from one job to another and try to try to explain to the employer that you have the skills they need when the job itself may be something completely different. It's those professional skills that you can demonstrate and that employers have indicated they really, really value and they think is really important. So I've um, included a couple of examples from things that we're doing in our program. We have two professional development seminars that the students are required to take. So these are just a couple of examples from, from these programs. I made them really generic because I know you would have to change them anyway, but this one is about networking. One of the things that we're trying to get the students to do is make connections out there in the industry. And this is fairly early on in their undergraduate program. So we're trying to get them to identify people who are in the industry who are doing things like they want to do. And the good thing about it for them at that point is we're there to help guide them, right? Because in digital marketing, it's there is a lot of information out there. There are a lot of people um, pushing information out there. Not all of it is accurate. And so us being there to help kind of curate the content and guide the students toward who are the people out there you should be paying attention to, and then saying, how are you gonna connect with those people? Are you gonna follow them on Twitter? Are you gonna connect with them on LinkedIn? Are you going to try to maybe establish a deeper personal connection with them in some way? How are you gonna go about doing that? Um, so a lot of students, um, 
don't love this idea, um, but we think that it's really important and it's worth kind of, um, you know, giving them a little, a little bit of a push to maybe uh, go a little bit outside of their own comfort zones. Uh, my programs are all online, so we have discussion boards every week. This is a sample discussion post where we um, created a fictional scenario talking about um, an employee working for, in our case, it was this new startup company, and the, the employee was the social media manager, supposed to do all these things. At any rate, there's a whole scenario, but the idea of it is to have the students look at that scenario and say, here are some things that the employee did that maybe they could have done differently. And also to kind of get them to name those things, right? Because one of the other issues with these skills is because they are sort of amorphous like that, students don't even know what to call them. So even just sometimes giving them the language for what this is, it can be helpful. Um, lastly, um, and this doesn't necessarily apply to everyone's class, of course, but if you are teaching students or working with students on resumes or their LinkedIn profile or interviewing, helping them understand how to, how to kind of pull in their soft skills to, uh, to um, further enhance what they're saying are their more hard skills. So this is an example from the Muse. I personally think this better example is probably way too much for a resume, um, but it might be okay on a LinkedIn profile. It would definitely be okay, in my opinion, in an interview, because you're saying, here's the, here's the sort of the, the hard skill that I can demonstrate. I increased positive customer sentiment by 34%. That's very tangible, right? But I did that by motivating, engaging, team building events, all of those kinds of more soft skill things that again, as an interviewer, I want to see, I want to hear that you have those kinds of skills. Um, and last slide, um, I just wanna talk briefly about this. The Department of Education um, created this employability skills framework and checklist. Um, there's a link to it um, in my presentation. And um, you can see, so it's sort of this wheel, it's interactive, so if you click on any section of it, you'll get what you see on the right-hand side. So this is the workplace skills for applied knowledge. This is a useful tool for us as educators, but I think it's also a useful tool for students, again, to kind of see that this is important enough that the Department of Education actually created this entire framework to help us as educators make sure that they as students are getting the skills that they need. And so the, the US Department of Education says, defining, measuring, and building these skills, even naming them can be challenging. So at least we know the Department of Education feels our pain, um, but you know, again, this is something that, that I feel pretty passionate about that we can we are really obligated to help our students do, do a, as good of a job as we possibly can with this stuff. So that's it for me. Um, if there are any questions, I am happy to answer them. Great, we do have a few questions. Uh, if, you've, if you were holding off to the end to answer those, feel free to just punch those right into the, the old chat bar here on the right. So the first question, um, do students receive professionalism score in every class? And do you have a clear rubric for the students um, on what you are grading in professionalism? Yes and yes. Um, there is a professionalism um, assignment in every single class that the students are actually, um, the online students are required to acknowledge that they saw it. Um, so they can't just skip by that. They have to say, I saw that there are these professionalism standards and there is an entire rubric of a list of things that you can lose points for, but also things that you can gain points for. And for, for the gaining points, which is really the aspect that we want to emphasize, um, it, we're, we're very clear about it. When we have guest speakers come in, when it's posted online for our students to see, it says, this is a GPS event. If you participate in this event, 
you can get GPS points for doing this. So it's very, very pretty clearly articulated for the students what our expectations are. That's great. Um, I've I've really enjoyed this uh, presentation, Rob. I just thinking here at Stucan through the pro hiring process, and we see a lot of folks who come through who have the skill set, the hard the hard skills, but we have multiple interview interviews in our process where we're analyzing if they're a culture fit, and a lot of that soft, a lot of those soft skills thing show up in those culture fit uh, uh, interviews because if you know what you're doing, but you can't you can't work in a team and, and you can't you know you're going to be a headache here. Um, it makes it it just makes it hard for that individual to thrive uh, in in our workplace and other workplaces have uh, different sets of culture fit and and um, things like that. But the whole soft skill side of it is great. Uh, what what is the one or two soft skills you see students struggle with the most? This is a great question. Even even after you're you're done teaching them, what are those one or two skills that seem to just be there all the time? Well, so I'll go with two because one of them is my personal thing. Um, I am really big on being able to communicate in writing. And I feel like even as much as, as we try to get students up to a level they need to be, that is an area that is really, really difficult. Um, and, and, you know, I do think that there is only so much of that that we can do, but it is teachable. And I think one, that's one of the things that people say, well, I'm not a great writer. But writing is so it's, it's not in your DNA. You, learn, you can learn the rules of punctuation and grammar. Um, so I, I think that is my, my personal thing. I think depending on the student, getting the students who are more introverted to get out of their comfort zone a little bit. and like when I talked about the networking, some students are really resistant to that because they're intimidated by it all and all that kind of stuff. And just, so I don't know that confidence is necessarily something that we can teach them, but if we can help them feel a little more comfortable, you know, I, I know sort of along those lines, a lot of times people will say to me, well, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this job, you know, kind of on the side and I don't know how much to charge because I, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, well, yes, you do know because you've been do, going through the school and you may not be the world's foremost expert on the subject, but you probably do know. And giving them that little bit of confidence, I think probably goes a long way with all of the other things. Questions. I just see some some positive reinforcing comments here. Uh, effective communication is so essential. I think everyone can agree with uh, with that. So, um, if there are any other questions, Robert, we we appreciate your time here. Uh, enjoy sunny Florida. I uh, didn't see you get uh, go for the the water bottle grab, and maybe I missed it. But it sounds like you just you just steamrolled right through it. So nice, nicely done. I, I think maybe talking a thousand miles an hour made it possible to, <laughs> to do that. Nice. Well, thank you so much. Uh, have a fantastic weekend, Robert.